Now we're going to begin chapter 13, where we're going to look at aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And we'll use this model to analyze the macroeconomy. So in this chapter, first we're going to look at aggregate demand. We're going to try to understand the demand side of the macroeconomy. From there, we'll move on to aggregate supply. And again, we'll try to understand the supply part, that portion of the macroeconomy. In the third section, we'll look at macroeconomic equilibrium in the long run and the short run. So we'll be putting together the aggregate supply and aggregate demand curves. And finally, we'll look at a dynamic aggregate demand and aggregate supply model in the final section of the chapter. Thus far in this class, we've seen how the U.S. economy has experienced a long-run upward trend in real GDP, that over time, real GDP has increased. This has increased the standard of living of all members of society. In the short run, however, real GDP fluctuates around this long-term upward trend because of the business cycle, which we talked about in the previous chapters. Fluctuations in real GDP lead to fluctuations in employment, and these fluctuations in real GDP and employment are the most visible and dramatic part of the business cycle that people experience. So in this chapter, what we're going to do is expand our discussion of the business cycle, and we'll do this by developing the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, and then put them together to understand what's going on for different periods of the business cycle. And this will help us analyze the effects of recessions on expansions, excuse me, recessions and expansions on production, employment, and prices. So in the short run, real GDP and the price level are determined by the intersection of the aggregate demand curve and the aggregate supply curve. The aggregate demand curve shows a relationship between the price level and the quantity of real GDP demanded by households, firms, and the government. Well, the aggregate supply curve is a curve that shows the relationship in the short run between the price level and the quantity of real GDP supplied by firms. And we're going to put these together to help understand what's going on in the macro economy. Earlier in the course, we talked about supply and demand in individual markets. And for that, we could determine very simply and intuitively why demand curves slope downwards in markets. Because as the price of a good or service is lower, individuals and households are able to afford more. The demand curve is still going to slope downward in the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, but because we're looking at the macro economy and the entire economy as a whole, it's going to be downward sloping for a different reason. So we're going to explore that at the beginning of the section. Now remember, real GDP has four components, consumption, investment, government purchases, and net expenditures. When we add the four of these up, that gives us real GDP. The aggregate demand curve is downward sloping because a fall in the price level increases the quantity of real GDP demanded. To understand why, what we're going to have to do is look at how changes in the price level affect each component of aggregate demand. So we're going to begin with the assumption that government um, and government purchases are determined by the policy decisions of lawmakers. So they're not going to be affected by changes in the price level. Then, after that, we can consider the effect of changes in the price level on the three other components of consumption. There are three other components, so consumption, investment, and net exports. So household consumption is most strongly determined by income. And that should make sense to us. So as income rises, household's consumption is going to increase. And as income falls, consumption is going to decrease. But consumption also depends on overall health household wealth, which is the difference between the value of the household assets and the value of its debts. So for an example, let's think about two households. Both of them have incomes of $80,000 per year. The first household has a wealth of $5 million. And the second household has a wealth of $50,000. So the first household is likely to spend more of its income than the second household. That should make sense to us because the first household has so much more money already saved, already tied up in wealth that they can have a lower savings rate and still have a very high amount of savings. Whereas the first household, they have a very low level of wealth, so they're gonna have to have much higher savings for the future. So as total household wealth rises, consumption is gonna rise. Now some household wealth is held in nominal assets. So as the price levels rise, the real value of household wealth declines. So this is gonna result in less consumption. 
So our implication here is that higher price levels are going to lead to lower consumption. Next, let's look at interest rates, so how a change in the price level affects investment. When prices rise, households and firms need more money to finance buying and selling. Because of this, when the price level rises, households and firms will try to increase the amount of money they hold by withdrawing funds from banks, borrowing from banks, or by selling financial assets, like bonds. These actions tend to drive up the interest rate bank charge on loans and the interest rate on bonds. So a higher interest rate raises the cost of borrowing for households and firms. Now what this is going to result in is firms are going to borrow less to build new factories or to install new machinery and equipment, and households are going to borrow less to buy new homes. So basically, our implications here is that higher prices, higher price levels lead to lower investment. And a lower price level is going to decrease the interest rate, increase investment spending. And finally, let's look at international trade, so how a change in the price level affects the net exports. Net exports equal spending by foreign households and firms on goods and services produced in the United States, minus spending by U.S. households and firms on goods and services produced in other countries. If the price level in the United States rises relative to the price levels in other countries, U.S. exports will become relatively more expensive, and foreign imports will become relatively less expensive. So. Some consumers in foreign countries are going to shift from buying U.S. products to buying domestic products made in their own country. And some U.S. consumers will also shift from buying U.S. products to buying imported products. What's going to happen is U.S. exports are going to fall and U.S. imports are going to rise. So net exports are going to fall, reducing the quantity of goods and services demanded. So a lower price level in the United States relative to other countries has a reverse effect. So it causes net ex exports to rise, thereby increasing the quantity of goods and services demanded in the United States. So all three of these effects show higher price levels leading to lower values for the components of real GDP. And this is why the aggregate demand curve is going to slope downward. So just like we had a difference between movements in the demand curve and movements along the demand curve for individual markets, we have the same thing for the aggregate demand curve. So the aggregate demand curve shows the relationship between the, the price level and the real GDP demanded, holding everything else constant. So if a change in the price level is not caused by a component of real GDP changing, it's going to result in movement along the aggregate demand curve. You're going to move from one point on the curve to another. But if there's a change in some component of aggregate demand, on the other hand, this is going to shift the entire aggregate demand curve, increasing either moving it to the left or to the right. So there are three variables that shift the aggregate demand curve. And you can break these down into three categories. So the changes in government policy, changes in the expectation of households and firms, and changes in foreign variables. So first, let's look at a change in government policy. So government policy change can shift aggregate demand. The first category, policy changes, are monetary policy. These are the actions of the Federal Reserve, or our country's central bank. The Federal Reserve takes different actions trying to manage the money supply and the interest rates of the U.S. economy to ensure the flow of funds from lenders to borrowers is stable. The Federal Reserve takes these actions in order to achieve macroeconomic policy objectives. Their policy objectives are things like high employment and price stability, and high but steady rates of economic growth. So if the Federal Reserve takes actions that cause interest rates to rise, investment spending is going to fall. That's what we see in the graph at the top of the page. So an increase in interest rates shifts the aggregate demand curve to the left, because higher interest rates raise the cost to households and to firms of borrowing. So it's going to reduce consumption and investment spending. On the other hand, if the Federal Reserve takes actions that reduce interest rates, the cost of firms and households of borrowing is going to decline. So lower borrowing cost increases consumption and increases investment spending, which is going to shift the aggregate demand curve to the right.
The other type of government policy is fiscal policy. So this is changes in federal taxes and in federal purchases that are intended to achieve macroeconomic policy objectives. So because these government purchases are one of the components of aggregate demand, an increase in government purchases shifts the aggregate demand curve to the right, and a decrease in government purchases shifts the aggregate demand curve to the left. Now, an increase in personal income taxes reduces households' disposable income, so the amount of money they have on hand to spend. So that's going to reduce their consumption spending and shift the aggregate demand curve to the left. On the other hand, a decrease in personal income taxes shifts the aggregate demand curve to the right. An increase in business taxes reduces the profitability of investment spending and shifts the aggregate demand curve to the left. Just like for personal income taxes, a decrease in business taxes shifts the aggregate demand curve to the right as businesses have greater profitability, so they'll be more likely to engage in investment spending. Next variable is changes in expectations of households and firms. So if households become more optimistic about their future incomes, they're likely to increase their current consumption. They're also likely to increase spending on new houses, thereby increasing investment spending. This increased spending will shift the aggregate demand curve to the right. But on the other hand, if households become more pessimistic about their future incomes, what we'll see is the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left. And we'll see pretty much the same thing with firms. If firms become more optimistic about the future profitability of investment spending, the aggregate demand curve will shift to the right. And if firms become more pessimistic, the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left. The final variables that affect the shift in the aggregate demand curve is changes in foreign variables. So if households and firms in other countries buy fewer U.S. goods, or if households and firms in the U.S. buy more foreign goods, net exports are going to fall, and the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left. When real GDP increases, so does the income available for consumers to spend. If real GDP in the U.S. increases faster than real GDP in other countries, U.S. imports will increase faster than U.S. exports, and net exports are going to fall. We also see net exports change when exchange rates change. So if the exchange rate, or the value of the U.S. dollar rises, our exports become more expensive, so foreign buyers buy less of them. And we end up buying more imports. So if we break down real GDP into its components, we can better understand the 2007 to 2009 recession. So what we saw was consumption spending in the figure on the right relative to potential GDP fall during the recession. Now this is unusual because consumption usually stays steady during a recession. And consumption also stayed low um, after the recession. Now residential investment had been falling before the recession started and continued to fall during the recession. The housing market peaked in about 2006 and began falling, but the recession didn't begin until late 2007. And spending on residential investment as a percentage of potential GDP has continued to be below the pre-recession levels, which was considered the housing boom. The non-housing components of investment actually rose relative to potential GDP during the recession. Finally, net exports increased or became less negative just before the recession began and throughout the recession. And this was in part due to the falling value of the U.S. dollar compared to other countries. After the recession, net exports started to decrease again, but it stayed relatively steady, as loose monetary policy has kept the value of the U.S. dollar down. So what can account for these facts? Well, first, as I mentioned earlier, the housing sector underwent a boom from 2002 to 2005, where we saw rapid increases in housing prices and spending on new homes. But once the housing market peaked in the beginning of 2006, we saw a sharp decline in residential investment, which is what the graphs bear out. And the continued low levels of residential investment can help explain why the recession was one of the longest since the Great Depression and while the economic expansion that began in 2009 has been relatively weak.
You also saw and experienced high levels of unemployment, and that reduced household incomes and led to declines in consumption spending. Now, the high levels of unemployment persisted for a long time, which is why we saw consumption spending so low for so long after the recession. Additionally, many households increased their savings and they began to pay off their debts during the recession because of how indebted households became over the early 2000s. And finally, the Federal Reserve underwent historic efforts to reduce the interest rates, and they kept the federal funds rate, or their target interest rate, as close to zero as possible for years after the financial crisis, thereby reducing the prices of U.S. exports and increasing the prices of foreign imports. Now that we've finished discussing aggregate demand, let's move on to aggregate supply, which shows the effect of changes in the price level on the quantity of goods and services that firms are willing and able to supply in the market. Because of the effect of changes in the price level and aggregate supply, it's very different in the short run from what is in the long run. So we're going to use two aggregate supply curves, one for the short run and one for the long run. So we're going to start by talking about the long run aggregate supply curve. The long run aggregate supply curve is a curve that shows the relationship in the long run between the price level and the quantity of real GDP that's supplied. So in the long run, the level of real GDP is determined by the number of workers, the level of technology, and the capital stock. By capital stock, we mean the factories, the machinery, those sorts of things that go into production. None of these elements are affected by the price level. So in the long run, the aggregate supply curve does not depend on the price level. So it's going to be a vertical line. The long run aggregate supply occurs at the level of potential or full employment GDP, which is going to advance every year. Now, why does the long run aggregate supply curve shift to the right each year? There's three reasons why this is going to occur. First reason that the potential real GDP increases each year is that the number of workers in the economy in increases over time as more and more people are being born and entering the workforce. Second, the economy accumulates more machinery and more equipment, so it's going to increase our potential production. And finally, technological change occurs over time, increasing each worker's productivity. So this figure on the right shows the vertical long-run aggregate supply curve and shows it shifting to the right as potential GDP increases from one year to the next. So the, the long run aggregate supply curve is gonna be vertical. But the short run aggregate supply curve, this is gonna be upward sloping. Now why is this? This is because over the long run, excuse me, over the short run, as the price level increases, the quantity of goods and services firms are willing to supply are gonna increase. Firms supply more goods and services as the price level increases for two main reasons. The first is that as the price of final goods and services rise, the prices of inputs, so things like wages of the workers or the price of natural resources, these are going to rise more slowly. So profits rise when the prices of goods and services that firms sell rise more rapidly than the prices they pay for inputs. So a higher price level leads to higher profits and increases the willingness of firms to supply more goods and services. There's also a secondary reason. So as the price level rises, some firms are slow to adjust their prices. So a firm that's slow to raise its prices when the price level is increasing may find its sales increasing and therefore will increase production. Economists tend to believe that some firms and workers fail to accurately predict changes in the price level. And there's three potential explanations for why the short run aggregate supply curve is upward sloping why some firms adjust prices more slowly than others. And that is, contracts make some wages and prices sticky, so they lock in prices over the short to medium term. So firms are unable to, to raise their prices or change their prices and wages um, to respond to the changes in price level because they're locked into contracts. The second is firms are often slow to adjust, rate, rate, um, adjust wages. They're hesitant to increase their wages for workers because they don't want to increase them for a short-term change and then have to decrease them later because no worker wants to have their wages cut. And finally, menu costs make some prices sticky. So menu costs are the cost it takes to actually 
change the prices that you're selling on the displays. So let's dig deeper into why the short run aggregate supply curve is upward sloped. The first reason is contracts make some wages and prices sticky. Now by sticky, economists mean that they don't respond quickly to changes in either supply or demand. So for example, let's suppose you have an airline. Negotiate a three-year contract with the Airline Pilots Association, the union that represents um, the pilots that fly the company's planes. If they negotiate a three-year contract, they're going to lock in those wages for three years. So if there's a change in aggregate supply or aggregate demand during those contracts, there's not going to be a way to change those contracts. Again, because they're legally locked in. They've agreed to those. And when firms or workers fail to predict the price level changes, they don't anticipate fully the price changes in the future, whether they over-anticipate inflation or under-anticipate inflation. Um, they're not going to correctly build in um, the inflation into these long-term contracts. And again, the wages aren't going to be able to respond. Same thing for firms that are looking at, um, at pur they purchase supplies over the long term. They lock into a long-term contract. Prices that they're going to pay aren't going to respond to changes um, in ag aggregate supply or aggregate demand. And next is the firms are often slow to adjust wages. So, for instance, you'll often have annual salary reviews where you'll go before your, man your manager or some of your bosses and you talk about your performance. And based on your performance for the year, they'll give you a raise. Again, this happens typically once a year. So these aren't happening very frequently. So if there's changes to aggregate supply or aggregate demand, um, firms aren't going to incorporate them until the annual review process. And also, firms hate cutting wages. When you reduce an employee's wages, um, they're going to have much lower morale. Obviously, no one likes having their wages cut, and it's difficult to deal with, and no one likes that. So firms try to avoid doing that because of this. However, that means they're often reluctant to adjust wages on the upside as well, that they'll hesitate a little bit before increasing wages, again, because they're not going to ever decrease wages. They don't want to have to do that. And finally, menu costs make some prices sticky. Again, menu costs are the cost of firms of actually changing their prices. So like if you own a restaurant, this is where the example comes from. You're going to print out your menu ahead of time with the prices on there. Now, if there's very short-term or small fluctuations, firms aren't going to take the time to actually print whole new menus, you know, go through all the costs of printing those new menus um, for the new higher price, if it's only going to be temporary or if it's not very large. Because they'll end up losing more money um, for actually printing the new menus than they would um, lose from having the prices being too low. So it should make intuitive sense to us that wages are going to be sticky for employees. Employers aren't going to want to cut wages because no one likes to have their wages cut. And the firms are going to be hesitant to increase wages. But it's unclear in, in um, the real world just how sticky are wages, just how slow are wages to respond to changes in aggregate supply and aggregate demand. Well, there is some good evidence that wages are at least sticky downward. So the firms are very reluctant to reduce the wages of their current employees. So during a recession, instead of cutting nominal wages, instead of paying all their employees lower wages, what they tend to do is fire current workers. So instead, just reduce some of the workers and have the rest of them work a little bit harder. So that way, they're, the wages they're being paid is equal to the, you know, the marginal product that they're providing to the company. They'll also freeze pay, so they'll stop paying increases, but they won't actually go and cut wages. And they'll... They typically offer lower salaries to new workers. So the new workers are hiring and bringing in. They're going to bring them in at a lower wage than um, the, the workers they already have working for the company. Just like we talked about with the aggregate demand curve, there's we have to deal with the difference between the movements along the short run aggregate supply curve and a shift in the short run aggregate supply curve. So remember, the short-run aggregate supply curve describes the relationship between the price level and the quantity of goods and services that firms are willing to supply in the entire macro economy. When we're holding constant all variables that affect the willingness of firms to supply goods and services. So changing the price level that's not caused by the factors that would otherwise affect the short-run aggregate supply are going to result in movements along a stationary short-run aggregate supply curve. 
So the curve itself is not going to shift. You're going to be moving along a shorter diagonal supply curve. But there are some factors that cause the short run aggregate supply curve to shift, and we're going to consider them over the next couple slides. So first we're going to look at is the expectation of future prices, and we'll see how that affects the short run aggregate supply curve. So if workers and firms believe that the price level is going to increase, let's say by 3% during the next year, they're going to try to adjust their wages and prices accordingly. So Working through this example, if, labor, if a labor union believes that there's going to be a 3% inflation over the next year, then the union representatives know that wages must rise 3% if the purchasing power of those wages are to stay the same. So if they want their employees to be just as well off as they were the previous year, wages are going to have to rise by 3%. So there's going to be a lot of workers, the ones that anticipate this 3% increase in inflation or increase in the price level. Um, they're going to try to get wages that are 3% higher. What that's going to do is shift the short-run aggregate supply curve to the left. So any level of real GDP is now associated with a price level that is 3% higher. Because when, firm, when, um, yeah, when firms have to pay their employees 3% higher wages, that's going to increase the cost of um, their labor cost by 3%. So it'll cost the, increase the cost of goods they're producing by 3%. So it's going to increase the price level by 3%. So what we have is inflation expectations, these changes in the price level that they're expecting, becomes a self-reinforcing idea. So in general, if workers and firms expect the price level to increase by a certain percentage, the short-run aggregate supply curve will shift by an equivalent amount. So what are some other variables that shift the short-run aggregate supply curve? Well, the next one is increases in the labor force or in the capital stock. So there's an increase in the availability of these factors of production that will allow more production at a price level. So the labor force and the capital stock, let's say they increase, the firm is going to supply more output at every price level. So the short-run aggregate supply curve is going to shift to the right. On the other hand, if you have a country like Japan where you have the population that's aging, the labor force is going to be decreasing. So if we hold constant all the other variables, this decrease in the labor force that Japan's experiencing is going to cause the short-run aggregate supply curve to shift to the left. Similarly, improvements in technology allow productivity to improve. So what that's going to do is increase the level of production at any given price level. Again, this is going to shift the, the short-run aggregate supply curve to the right. I already mentioned how expected future prices will shift the aggregate supply curve. So if you have expectations that prices are going to increase in the future, you're going to shift the short-run aggregate supply curve to the left. Now also, if workers and firms had previously underestimated what the rate of inflation was going to be. As workers and firms um, see this new level of inflation, they find out they were wrong and they adjust the actual amount of inflation. If they under anticipate inflation, so inflation is higher than what they thought it was going to be, they anticipated 1% inflation, they asked for wage increases of 1%, and it turned out the inflation rate was 3%. As workers and firms recognize that, they're going to ask for higher wages, and firms are going to ask for higher prices for their goods. So that's also going to shift the short-run aggregate supply curve to the left, just like what we saw with the expected future prices. Only instead of people anticipating higher prices in the future, they had anticipated too low of prices in the future, and they're now getting a uh, more accurate perception of what the price changes were. The final variable we're going to look at that shifts the short-run aggregate supply curve is a supply shock. So unexpected changes in the price of an important natural resource. The supply shock is an unexpected event that causes a short-run aggregate supply curve to shift to the left. So let's rewind the clock back to the 1970s. What we saw during the 1970s, OPEC, for the first time, the oil-producing countries, the cartel they formed, flexed their muscles, and they reduced the output of oil. 
What this did is increase oil prices substantially throughout the 1970s. So what happened? Firms immediately anticipated rising inflation, rising input prices because of the higher price of oil. So they had to increase their pricing. What this did is shift the short run aggregate supply curve to the left. So unexpected input pr price increases, like the increase in oil prices, decreases the short run aggregate supply. And unexpected input price decreases. So if the price of oil suddenly falls in the future, that would shift the short run aggregate supply curve to the right instead.